741, text it uh, to, and you'll uh, text that number and you'll get to a real person. And it might even be Laura. <laughs> That's what everybody will do. Before yes. we start, you're not from pod therapy, are you? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, that is me. Okay, next. Yeah. <laughs> Skip. Can Stop. I get somebody in? <laughs> Capital <laughs> S-T-O-P, please. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's no, 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 come back. <laughs> <laughs> well, Laura, thank you so much for coming on, and yeah, uh, thank you, you know, especially for the community service of putting up with Nick, um, and and the oh. suicide thing too is very important. <laughs> but um, thank you. Now, for, remember, I was, yeah. I'm just going to say he has to deal with me too. Oh, okay, so, that's the other I half mean, of that. Yeah. You know, and he's a therapist, so just yeah. imagine <laughs> what he has to go through. <laughs> and both of us together have to deal with you. That's right. Exactly. On a minimal basis, I'm minimally a problem, but occasionally a problem. So, but uh, Viva La Mexico, and thank you for what you're doing for the community. We really appreciate it. Oh, thank you. And thanks for being for on the show. Me. Thank you. In our pod therapy. Yeah. Um, Unfortunately, Laura is not able to stick around and answer questions. Neither am I. Take care, Nick. All right. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) All right. We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we will uh, dive deeper into what a therapist does to deal with suicidality. You are listening to Pod Therapy. Okay. We are back from our break. Uh, let's get more into the details here. So the research came out from the Centers for Disease Control, the CDC, and basically what it indicated is that suicide is not only a major national problem, it's also on the rise. So here's what it says. In 2016, nearly 45,000 Americans aged 10 or older died by suicide. That's just in that year. Suicide is now the 10th leading cause of death and is one of just three leading causes that are on the rise and, and Nick, you know, this, this captivates the national consciousness because, you know, here's just a few names of people that we've lost in the recent past. Uh, we lost Kate Spade. We lost Anthony Bourdain, as you talked about whenever you learned about that from Mexico. We lost that DJ, Avicii, who's a big deal out here in Las Vegas. That was a big loss. Uh, we lost uh, Chester Bennington from Lincoln Park. We lost Chris Cornell from Soundgarden. And it, most folks remember when we lost Robin Williams, right. you know, and that was a huge conspicuous thing. And those are just celebrities. Those are people that, in theory, have access to resources. They have, you know, they're they're adored by lots of people. If they ever feel bad, they can open up their Twitter or open up their fan mail and just read all these people that adore them, you know, or, or just see the next offer for another TV show or another purse line or, you know, a new music deal. Linkin Park had just released an album that was going platinum again. They were in the midst of being on the top 200, and yet this this disease and this problem of suicide. Uh, really impacts. So from our perspective, looking at it as therapists and, and seeing this research, you know, not only do we want to introduce the listener to, you know, options like the text crisis line and, and what Laura works on, but as therapists, let's let's share with the listener a little bit some of the signs that we're looking for. So we tend to call these red flags, and these are sort of – they're not all created equal. There's There's different levels of severity, but we'll start on the low end and work our way up. So on the lower end of red flags, there's some few things that we're looking for. Let's unpack what those are, and then we'll kind of unpack what are the medium zone, and then what's kind of like the really, oh my gosh, we're really concerned zone. So what's something that we look for, Nick? Well, one of the first things would be hopelessness, yeah. uh, a sense of uh, future or, or negativity. Like yeah. I'm in a spot where I, I'm, there's no way out of this. Um, we see this especially in um, like with gambling, yes. right? financial hopelessness. But there's also hopelessness, um, you know, as Laura had talked about with uh, relationships. Yes. And so when we're seeing somebody that presents as hopeless, they don't feel like they have a sense of their future. They seem perpetually negative. Listen, that does not mean if you have a friend who's going through the blues that you need to call the suicide hotline for him immediately. But I'm just saying this is a red flag. We are noticing it. But we continue to look for more factors. Okay. And so another thing that we're looking for is does the person uh, express that they feel trapped? Now, they don't have to feel trapped, but that is another red flag. If they tell us that they feel stuck, without options, they feel vulnerable, they don't feel like they're, they have uh, the ability to navigate their own life, they feel like life happens to them, not the other way around, that is at times a red flag for us, especially if they also feel very hopeless for their future because we know that that begins planting the seeds of suicidal thinking. And um – Feeling like their life has no meaning, right? Uh, no purpose, or making comments about um, feeling like there's no reason for leaving or uh, living. Yes, yes. Um, and this, it's important to notice too that they may not be directly stating this, but sometimes right. it's kind of like a hidden, uh, you know, a message kind of 
that yeah, yeah. Sometimes you detect it. Yeah, yeah, they don't really have that. So those are sort of lower end red flags, guys. Now, again, if we see that, we're we're not necessarily panicking for the person. We're not going to call the police. We're as therapists, we're probably going to feel very comfortable asking them. And this is something we ask everybody all the time mm-hmm. when we first meet them. We say, "Do you have any thoughts about self harm? Have you ever wanted to hurt yourself? Have you ever imagined doing that?" Um, and again, as Laura was saying, our guest earlier. It is entirely appropriate to be direct and ask just straight up, hey, is this something that, that you've gone through that you're thinking about? But another red flag that's a little bit more advanced is anger. So whenever we see that there's sort of this uh, illogical rage or desire for revenge, inability to calm down, especially in men, uh, that to us is actually an indicator light that they actually might be depressed or they might actually have uh, this desire to self-harm because there's sort of this simmering rage, this hotness um, if we see that in perpetuity, that's something that we're alarmed about. Yeah, another one that people might be surprised about is insomnia, mm. um, sleeplessness, or uh, you know, it's kind of their un- their inability to reboot mentally. Right. Um, you know, when your brain and your body doesn't get that rest, it, your your thinking is not going to be very clear. Yeah. And you, it, does pose a risk. And insomnia is a side effect of lots of different things, anxiety, depression, a lot of other things. But if we're seeing this in combination with other factors, we're starting to form this hypothesis that this person could be at risk for suicidal thinking. And then another kind of medium zone uh, you know, red flag for us is anhedonia, which if you're a listener to the show, you've heard our use uh, of that word before. Anhedonia means the loss of pleasure or joy in the things that you used to take joy in, you know, just going to lunch with a buddy or, um, you know, uh, seeing your kids or uh, your favorite TV show comes on, just those little pieces of joy. When you're no longer experiencing those and you feel like you're in this listlessness and this gray life, um, that tells us that you might be at risk for the thought of suicide or self-harm. Mm-hmm. As well as um, talking about death, yes. um, referencing to or references to death, dying, um, just a general interest in the subject. Yeah, and that's different from somebody who just enjoys the artisticness of death. You know, if they are a goth or you know they're into the more morose, you know, that's that's different. If mm-hmm. <laughs> just because somebody's you know uh, reading you know poetry, you know, like the Raven or something like that, that doesn't mean that they're necessarily at risk for suicide. Yeah. You know? you, Probably wouldn't be the right time to have them committed or anything. No, <laughs> no, not, not for that. Yeah, but that as a therapist, when we start seeing the other symptoms, plus now we're talking about death abstractly or the person brings it up unguided, unprovoked, uh, we notice that. And that really becomes something that we want to bring it up again and say, hey, just to clarify, um, is there any thought about self-harm? But another one is isolation. Whenever a person disappears, they're avoiding friends, they're avoiding family, they're not getting into work, they don't uh, participate in their social life. Now, some people are natural introverts. Fine. That's their baseline. But whenever you see a departure from their norm and they start to isolate, that's a huge warning sign. Mm-hmm. Um, drugs and alcohol. Yes. That's a big warning sign as well. Um, you know, they're numbing themselves, um, demonstrating no, uh, self-control. Mm-hmm. And they're turning themselves off. And once they become physically abusive to themselves, the drug and alcohol, um, that's in a sense, a form of slow motion suicide. It usually represents a lack of self-care and this disregard for me to help, you know, to hell with it. Nobody loves me anyway, or I don't mm-hmm. care about myself. Um, but now th- those are kind of the medium zone red flags. Now here are the really big ones. The deep crimson reddest of red, the stuff that we are really concerned about. The, the first is access to method. And what that means is we'll ask a person when we're interviewing them, have you thought about hurting yourself? If they say yes, then we'll say, if you were going to hurt yourself, how would you do it? I mean, do you have access? Do you have a gun at home? Do you have knives? Do you have pills? Do you have poison? Um, we don't plant those ideas, but we ask about them mm-hmm. because if a person can identify, yes, I have a gun at home or my dad has a gun at home or I have this ability to hurt myself, that's a huge warning sign actually because it makes it more possible to do it. And so we know the likelihood drastically increases. Which goes along with the next one, which is having a plan. Yes. And you know, we can tell a lot by the detail of the plan. You know, if you ask somebody um, – are, are the, do they want to hurt themselves? Do they have a plan and how they're going to do it? And they're like, yes, I know exactly how I'm going to do it. I'm going to drive over to the Hoover Dam. I'm going to get out. I'm going to park in this one spot that I always go to. I'm going to go out on the bridge. I'm going to go, right. you know, we're starting to see like, oh, okay, he's thought this through. They've run the simulation. Right. And this that, is, guys, is right. one of the biggest warning signs we can see. If we know somebody has a plan as a therapist, that's usually when we're going to take action. We usually drop what's called a safety contract. Um, and, you know, again, we're trained for more of those advanced skills. But but 
for somebody that is in your life, if they're telling you they have a plan or you're sensing that, yes, that's whenever you're going to sit with them and say, hey, can we call together? Mm -hmm. You know, can we call uh, together? Not just maybe for a therapist. That might even want to be a 311 call um, or a 911 call or texting the hotline or calling the hotline. And this is probably where I'm going to drop that number. Um, The the voice hotline, if you want to call the crisis hotline, the uh, suicide hotline, it's one 800 273 8255. That's 1 800 273 8255. Or you can call 911. And a lot of people don't realize that that's okay to do because they think, well, nobody's firing a gun in the air. Is this really something you call 911 for? Yes, because you can explain to the person what you're going through. It's their job to figure out how to respond, it's your job to report it. But when somebody can describe the plan that they have, that's something you ought to take very seriously. Mm -hmm. And then the last one is saying goodbye. If a person starts giving away their stuff, they start trying to bring closure, they start writing you know, notes to people, I loved you, you were great to me, goodbye, I wish you well, um, that is a huge warning sign because that's, it's an extension of making a plan. It's acting on the plan in some small way. It's laying the groundwork. If they're giving away stuff, hey, man, I just want you to have my car. Hey, I want you to have my computer. Hey, I want you to have my speakers. Like, I know you always liked this watch. I want you to have it. Uh, that's a huge warning sign. You got to pay attention to that. So, you know, Nick, what can they do? If you're a listener and, you know, you, you sense some of these red flags, what might you do about that? First, uh, um, you know, approach the situation directly in a setting that allows for a real conversation. Mm. You know, just be upfront about it. Um, and then also, you know, don't be afraid to, you know, ask straight out, are you thinking of hurting yourself? Have that conversation with them. Uh, do more than just give them phone numbers. You know, ask for permission to schedule a visit with a therapist and talk to them. Um, there yourself, you know, have that conversation, be open and stay in contact, Mm. follow up, give them a little extra attention, uh, check in on them every once in a while. Yes. And you know, the first thing Nick said is so important. Don't be afraid to ask directly. Um, but you know, also guys, we're, we're human beings. And so if you just send somebody a quick little, Hey, are you doing okay? And like Mm -hmm. you're on your way out the door, that might not be enough, you know, because they don't want to burden you. Right. But if you can intentionally pull them aside and say, John, I've noticed lately, you know, some of these red flags. I've noticed you seem hopeless. Uh, your your messages on Twitter and Facebook talk about you seem like really angry. You know, you talk about not having meaning in your life. I'm noticing you're not with us anymore. We invite you out to dinner. We invite you out to the movies, and you're never available. You seem isolated. And uh, you know, whenever I visited your house the other day, I saw a lot of empty bottles in the trash. You know, I'm, I'm starting to notice some red flags, man. Are you thinking about hurting yourself? Are you okay? And and sitting down and expressing, I'm I'm here to listen. I'm not checking my phone. I'm not running around, uh, but demonstrating that availability to really hear it. And then, you know, as Nick said, not being afraid to help them call a therapist or even to show up with them to a therapist and be the second person in the room. As a therapist, you know, we're trained. We're going to treat depression. We're going to help them navigate life obstacles. If there's trauma, we're going to observe and deal with that. We're also there to supervise their safety. We can take the ball and provide that expert guidance as far as when help is needed. Um, We usually give them our phone numbers. They can call or text us. We're part of the conversation. But again, if you're facing this, if there's somebody in your life that you know might need some help, the number is 1-800-273-8255 or just call 911. That is acceptable as well. Absolutely. You know, if it's if it's not appropriate for 911, 911 will tell you. That's <laughs> right. Yeah, don't worry. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they'll, they'll let you know. <laughs> they'll point you in the right direction. Yeah, but guys, if you're out there and you've had suicidal thinking, you're not broken, uh, you're not damaged, you're not sick, you're not ill. It is a normal thing that humans think about. It is a national problem. And uh, the strategy to fix it is each one reach one. Every one of us is going to take, you know, the, uh, the, the ball on this and just love on each other. And uh, together we're going to make it work. All right, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we will hear from a listener whose selfishness is sabotaging his relationships. You're listening to Pod Therapy. We're back. You're listening to Pod Therapy, and it's time to read our listener mail. And this one I have retitled because <laughs> the listener gave us a pretty good title, but I, I wanted to retitle it because I thought it captures it. And I retitled it Selfishness. Control Freak. Yeah, a little bit. <laughs> Selfishness is sabotaging relationship. I'm a 42-year-old man currently in the middle of a slow-moving divorce. I've had two more failed relationships since separating from my wife. My main problem that always causes problems is that I tend to get selfish and not be very empathetic to my partner. I don't realize that they are needing something from me. 
Whenever they tell me what they need, it always wakes me up and I'm always more than willing to do whatever it is. But by then, the damage seems to be done as they seem to want a man who does not need to be told what to do. Maybe I'm abnormal. But this seems to be asking a lot, since it seems akin to reading minds, especially if the woman's not 